My name is Michael Hoggard, I'm the pastor of Bethel Church in a little town of Festus, Missouri. Been pastor here for about 23 years now. It's a little town alongside the Mississippi River. In fact, my dad worked as a Mississippi River dredging inspector. Used to take me on his boat that he worked on, dredging the Mississippi River. We used to fish in the Mississippi. And I remember one night we were camping out along the banks of the Mississippi. We had been fishing for a day or two. We had a fire built, and I remember one night we saw a light coming across from the Illinois side of the river. And my dad noticed it, and he pointed it out to me, and I saw it. And it was strange because it was a, I mean, it was bright, it was brilliant. But it didn't make any sound. I was thinking that it was an airplane or a helicopter, but it, it wasn't making any sound at all. And it approached from the Illinois side. It looked like it had crossed about halfway across the river and was shining a light on the river. And we looked at it for a few seconds and then it was just gone. Now, I don't know if it was uh, an airplane. I don't know if it was a helicopter that we just didn't hear it. I don't know if it was a UFO. I don't know what it was. But it was strange to me. And that's about the only time that I think I can say that I've ever seen anything that you know might classify as a UFO. I've always been interested in UFOs. I'd, every time I would get to a new higher class in school, get to a different library, I always went to check out their UFO books. What, what books have I not read yet? And the subject of UFOs always fascinated me. I always wanted to know what those lights were, what those flying disks were, what people were seeing. I grew up here in this church, I've been part of this church. In fact, this church has been part of my life for most of my life. I've been here since I was about eight years old. So I've grown up and matured as a Christian, learning to see things the way the Bible says they are, not necessarily the way everybody else says they are. So when it comes to understanding what UFOs are, I want to know what they are from a biblical standpoint. And I can say, I've been studying this, I've been researching this for most of my life, but here just in the last month or two, I've really devoted myself to the testimonies, the, the, those who have seen UFOs, those who say they've been abducted, those who say that they are part of the military, CIA, Department of Defense, Air Force, Army. Those who say that they know for a fact that our government has recovered unidentified flying objects, their vehicles, testimonies of those who say that they saw the bodies of aliens, they actually touched them. Some say they were part of the autopsy team things like that. I don't know exactly what to say about all of that. I don't know exactly whether or not they're telling the truth. What I know is that the Bible does talk about things like that. It talks about, as far as a prophecy point is concerned, we're, we're at a time where we, I think, we're going to start seeing things come down from the heavens. Now, that's not going to be a good thing, in my opinion. I think that the things that are coming to this world, I think they have a lot of people deceived, but it just seems like for some reason right now, people are, are reaching out to the stars. I just saw this the other day, National Geographic. 
Uh, this just came out. And the cover story is, we are not alone. Scientists say there must be other life in the universe. And here's how they're searching for it. Uh, a lot of this goes back to Carl Sagan. He was the one who started SETI, or the search for extraterrestrial life. And this article goes into the details of what science, legitimate science, is doing. They're looking into the issue of, is there life on other planets? We have better telescopes than even what Carl Sagan had back in the 70s when he made the cosmos. Um, we have better ways of looking at the stars that are in the sky. And according to the astronomers, they're telling us that they're actually starting to see evidence that there are, in fact, planets that are revolving around stars, just like in our solar system. They say there's planets out there, and that they figure that there must, if there's planets, and those planets are within a certain range of whatever star they're circling around, that those planets would be candidates for possessing life. And what's interesting to me is, from a Christian standpoint, man is reaching out to the stars, looking for answers, looking for, you know, are we alone? Uh, and where did we come from? And who else is out there? They're reaching to the stars when all along they could have reached out to the one who made those stars. See, we rejected God as a people, as a society, as a culture in America. We rejected God. We rejected the Bible. We rejected the Ten Commandments. And because of that, there has, that void has to be filled with something else. So people choose to fill that void with drugs or they choose to fill it with the sensuous pleasures of this life or they choose to fill it with what they call scientific knowledge and now they're trying to expand that knowledge let's let's go beyond the moon let's go to mars see what we can find there we're explorers and let's try to explore beyond our own earth we we think we've covered just about every square inch of ground there is on this planet so now let's go and search out what's on the moon. Now let's go search out what's on Mars. Now, and there's people that probably in my lifetime may very well end up on Mars. They may end up dying there, but they may end up going to Mars. But we're wanting to reach out to the stars. We're wanting to find out if there's anybody out there. Uh, the movie Contact. Uh, I just rewatched it last night. I remember seeing it before years ago. And I think that story was written by Carl Sagan. And it was basically a fictionalized idea of us reaching out to the stars, listening, sending out radio signals, listening to see if any of them are coming back. That would give a sign that there's an intelligence out there. We contacted them. Now they're contacting us. That gives us something to grasp onto that we as a species can hope that one of these days we can make contact with these people from this other planet. And that's the goal of a lot of what's going on in physics, astronomy, science in general, is that they're reaching out to these stars to try to see. And most people believe that there has to be life, even people who believe in God, from a what used to be a Christian nation. The people who say they believe in God, they say that there has to be life on other planets. God would have made them like he would have made us. So why don't we all just get along? Let's reach out to them and let's just get along. And again, they're reaching out to the stars. And they're reaching short. They could have been reaching out to the creator of those stars. Knowing the creator would then... When you know the Creator and you know what He said about the creation, about how special and unique man is on this planet, when you know that, you don't stop at the stars. You go beyond those. You go to the Most High God who created everything. That's where I find 
my satisfaction, my peace in life is knowing that I know the Creator. I know Him. And I know what He says in His Word. He didn't just create us and then leave us alone. He's never left us. He's kept His Spirit and His Word with us all these years. But of course, man's rejected that. So man's got to reach out for something. So they're reaching out to these stars. There was an article, this odd-shaped asteroid. And the headline is, Alien Ship May Be Among Us. Harvard astronomer insists, despite grumbling and criticism from peers, because this big chunk of oblong-shaped rock was doing things that rocks are not supposed to do, apparently, in the skies. So it's got one Harvard astronomer thinking that that may have been some sort of ship, or they're saying that this rock came to us from another star system, and now it's approached our star system, and we have our first ever meeting of something from a different star in our own solar system. And once again, I just think that they're reaching too short. I think they're reaching to the stars when they could have reached to the creator of those stars, and they would have been a lot more satisfied, would have gotten a lot more better answers to their questions than just being so short-sighted as that. And the universe is big. The universe is huge. But the God that's on the other side of that universe is as near to us as living in our heart and reading from his word every day. Now, suppose I told you that the military has been collecting information, videos, pictures, reports, other evidence that we've been visited by people from some place in the stars. Suppose I said that one day the president decided to declassify all military files on UFOs and make them available to the press and to the public. With that declassification, over 400 videos were released that contained clear and concise evidence of unidentified aerial phenomenon, vehicles performing maneuvers that are not possible for any Earth-related vehicles. Now, what I just said to you is true. It just didn't happen in the United States. It happened in Ecuador. On July 19, 2007, Ecuadorian President Correa when he found out that the United States CIA had spy agents in the Ecuadorian intelligence services, he kicked them all out and made it clear to his own military and to his own spy agents that from now on, any information relating to UFOs once investigated, was going to be made public. You see, before that time, all these pilots, just like in America, they were seeing unidentified aerial phenomenon. That's the new name for it, UAP. They were seeing these things. They were chasing them. They had captured them on radar. Some of them had captured them on their onboard video systems. They would come back and report to their bosses what they'd saw, and their bosses would say, you can't tell this because the United States doesn't want us getting out with this information. So they didn't. Well, this Ecuadorian president, this new president, got in, and he made it clear that from now on, we're going to report these things, or they're going to be made public. And so they released over 400 videos, uh, some of them private, some of them uh, military, but a lot of it from just people seeing these things and reporting these things. So, you know, are they, are they real? When you have witnesses from all over the world, from like 1947 on, you have people all over the world that are seeing these things. And now in the days where everybody carries a camera with them everywhere they go because they're on our phones, 
now everybody's when they see them they're starting to take pictures and starting to take video of them pilots commercial airline pilots have been seeing these things for years military pilots have been seeing these things back in world war ii they called them foo fighters they thought it was the germans had come up with something um, the term flying saucers, uh, we'll get into that in a little bit, but that they started seeing these things and capturing them on radar, capturing them on their inboard flight systems, their video. And so it's hard for me to say that none of this exists because let's say in a year, let's say that all of the nations around the world, let's say they collected, I don't know, 300,000 UFO reports. I don't know where that number comes from, just made it up. Let's say in one year's time, there's 300,000 UFO reports or 30,000 UFO reports. You have to ask the question, how many of those reports have to be true in order for you to have something real to deal with? In my opinion, just one. If just one report is true of a craft flying through anywhere in this world doing maneuvers that the law of physics prohibits anything made in this world from doing, appearing and disappearing, traveling at speeds that if any craft from this world, manufactured in this world, traveled at those speeds, they would break apart. We, we already know that. So if just one out of, say, 30,000 reports from all over the world, if just one of those ends up being true, then you have a situation that has to be taken seriously. And most people... Uh, who see a UFO, especially in military or in commercial air travel, when they see these things, they don't report them because you're a kook or we don't want this out or your career is going to be finished. You'll never, you'll never get another raise. You'll never get uh, a promotion. Uh, nobody will ever take you serious because you said this. So a lot of people just don't say anything. But it's the age of the internet now. It's the age where now people are reporting and they don't care what everybody else says. They're showing the videos, they're showing the pictures, they're telling the stories, and they don't care what anybody thinks about them. They're telling these stories. And again, if you say that all of them, everything that everybody's saying is untrue, um, I'm going to say to you, think again. Now, I don't know that I can sit here and tell you that what everybody's saying is true, but what I can tell you is not everybody can be lying and not everybody can be wrong and not everybody is, is hallucinating and it's not all swamp gas or weather balloons. And again, if just one person is telling the truth that a craft entered into the airspace of the world doing maneuvers that no one else can do, doing things that no one else can do, appearing and disappearing at will, appearing at one place, being seen on radar, moving at four or five thousand miles an hour, disappearing, showing up a few seconds later, 300 miles away, traveling at way higher speeds than anybody else can travel on this earth. If just one of those is true, then you have a phenomenon. You have an issue that needs to be looked into it. And it, and it begs the question, what does the Bible say about this? Now, the last thing that I want is for anybody to say, Mike Hargard is a kook because he chases UFOs. I made a video on this several years ago, and I don't think I've talked about it, but about two or three times in the last several years that I've been doing six or seven or eight video sermons a week every week, I just don't talk about it very much, but it just seemed like the Lord laid this on my heart in the last month to talk about it. So I have a conference coming up and I was going to speak for an hour on it. So I decided to go back into the research again. And the things that I found are just are beyond belief. 
and those who believe the Bible and those who call themselves Christians, there needs to be an answer from somebody regarding what the scripture says about this issue. We have depictions. The closest thing that people who lived in time past had to photographs was artwork, cave drawings, carvings, etc. We have examples throughout recorded history of people seeing the gods or the chariots of these gods in the sky. Hieroglyphs, cave paintings of creatures that not quite human and not quite spirit. There's sort of something in between there. The Greeks, the Chinese, the Japanese, the early Romans, the Babylonians saw the gods moving across the sky in chariots. The Hindu sun god, Surya, the sun was supposed to move across the sky in a chariot drawn by spirit horses. From the Vedas, which are ancient Sanskrit text, you have the Vimanas. These were chariots of the gods flying through the heavens, able to go anywhere at almost any speed. Here's a cave drawing in Chahadasgar state in India. It makes you wonder whether they just drew this out of their imagination or these were things, beings and vehicles that they actually saw with their own eyes and they tried to record for posterity as best as they could. We have a new term now called paleo contact. It shows up in artwork, usually a, some sort of flying disc or brilliant light in the sky that just appears in the background and you would hardly notice it, but it's there. Somebody noticed that on an old coin a disc up in the sky with these teardrop shaped decorations on the bottom. Here is a painting in an old church and there is actually an old photograph of a UFO taken I think in the 1930s where it looks like the bottom of that matches the same teardrop design that's on that painting in this church. Here's the cover page of an old book, sort of a mathematics book, The Principles of Mathematics. And on the front of it, it has a disc shaped object with these lightning bolts coming down to it. And I noticed, I looked at it closely and I noticed that it looked like it had a portion of scripture. Psalm 84 verse 12. Well, when I went to Psalm 84, it didn't look like what verse 12 said, it looked like what verse 11 said, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. And then of course, verse 12, O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. So it looks like maybe they got the verse wrong and it was attempting to draw this picture of God who is acting as a sun and a shield. Here's some ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. And maybe I'm looking at this wrong, but it looks like a brilliant UFO with two aliens standing beside it. Uh, this stone here is in a Mexican museum. And it looks like a disc of some kind shining down upon someone it looks like they have a helmet on. I don't know, maybe maybe we're just reading things into this that isn't true, but it just looks like people were seeing things for many years. This just didn't show up in 1947. 
But I think people were seeing these things for years and were trying to draw them out as best as they could for posterity. In China, you have these depictions of chariots up in the clouds with different... This one is my favorite. It has uh, two bald-headed guys. Now, what's interesting to me is most people who say they see aliens, they say that they don't have any hair on their head at all. Is this what you know is being depicted here? I don't know. It just looks interesting that you have people from all different corners of the world throughout different ages in history who are all drawing a similar version of the gods going through the clouds in chariot. Here's another one where you have the scene of brilliant light coming down from the heavens, a disc shaped object that is the source of that light. Here on this painting here, it's a painting of I guess the Virgin Mary and over to the side there is what looks like a UFO, see how it's lit up and there's a guy actually looking at this thing. So. It seems to me that the artist is depicting himself and he must have at some point saw a UFO in the sky, didn't know what it was, didn't know how to present it to people, so he draws this religious painting and puts it in the background hoping that maybe nobody would see it or maybe somebody would see it. The depiction of gods in various types of suits. gods who are brightly illuminated, who have huge owl-like or insect-like eyes. Similar to what people see when they say they saw a gray alien. This one was known as the Flying Pearl. According to Chinese astronomer and scholar Shen Kuo, in his book Dream Pool Essays, written about 1088, an object that was described as, quote, a flying pearl appeared over the city of Yangzhou, China. This object had doors that opened and would emit a blinding light from its interior that cast a shadow from trees in a 10-mile radius and was able to take off at tremendous speeds. Even the renowned Jewish historian Flavius Josephus, Josephus' writings have been regarded as being um, pretty accurate by a lot of people, a lot of scholars, a lot of uh, Christians in their scholarly work will draw from Josephus. Well, Josephus reports an event that took place at the Siege of Jerusalem. Taking place in AD 65, he says, For before sunset throughout all parts of the country, chariots were seen in the air and armed battalions hurtling through the clouds and encompassing the cities. And when I first saw this, I remembered Elisha, the prophet who followed Elijah. Uh, there's a story in the Bible where him and his servant, they were being besieged in the city. And uh, his servant was pretty uptight about this. He, you know, we're going to die just at any minute now. And Elisha looked at him and he said, Lord, open his eyes. Open his eyes, let him see what I see. And he, and he told him, he said, They that be for us are more than they that be against us. And the servant's going, what are you talking about? Lord, open his eyes, let him see. And according to 2 Kings 6, 17, and Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes, that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And that brings to mind the story of Elijah and Elisha. See, Elisha knew what these were, these chariots of fire and horses of fire. He'd seen them before. He was with Elijah when Elijah was taken. He was taken from this world up into the heavens by a chariot and a horse that came down from the heavens. Second Kings chapter 2, verse 11, And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire 
and parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Now, the Bible actually tells us what this chariot and this horse really was. And, you know, Eric Von Daniken writes a book, and I read this book when I was, you know, in my youth, interested in UFOs. He writes Chariots of the Gods. Von Daniken gets it all wrong, as far as I'm concerned. Because he's looking at Ezekiel 1 and Zechariah, and he's trying to explain that Ezekiel didn't know what he saw. What Ezekiel saw was really a UFO. It was a disc-shaped object, and it was the chariot that the gods are coming in. And for all that von Daniken did, and all the research that he did, and all the knowledge he accumulated, he just didn't get it. He didn't understand the true nature of what it was that Ezekiel saw and Zechariah saw. Because what we're told from the scriptures is that these are actually part of the angelic realm. In Zechariah chapter 1, I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came four chariots out from between the two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of brass. The first chariot were red horses, and in the second chariot, black horses. And the third chariot, white horses, and the fourth chariot, grizzled and bay horses. Then I answered and said unto the angel that talked with me, What are these, my Lord? The angel answered and said unto me, These are the four spirits of the heavens which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. So there's your answer right there. These are not aliens. These are not greys, these are not the reptilians or from Alpha Centauri or Zeta Reticuli or the Pleiades or Vega. These are actually of the angelic realm. They are spirits. God made them this way. And what's really interesting to me is that he describes these four horses and these chariots in these particular colors, we have red, we have black, we have white, and then we have the, the grizzled and bay horses. Those same four horses show up in Revelation chapter 6, and really that's what initiates all of the events that take place in the book of Revelation as far as what's going to happen in the future. It's the appearance of these horses and these chariots that kick off what many people call the apocalypse. Revelation chapter 6 verse 1, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. When he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death. And hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. Now, from what I'm going to show you from this point out, you have a lot of people in this world that, as I said a while ago, they're reaching out to the stars. They want contact. They want these chariots, these UFOs, these vehicles, these saucers, or these bright lights in the sky. They want them to come down, and they want the people that are flying these things to come down with them because they think 
that these people are going to bring them into a new age of peace, enlightenment. They're going to cure man's diseases. They're going to give us uh, energy so we don't have to rely on coal and oil and tear up the earth. And all of these things, they're going to do great things for mankind. But you see, I believe the Bible. And I think the Bible's telling us that when these things appear, See, I don't think John was making this up, and I know there's metaphors in the Bible and symbols in the Bible, and surely each one of these has a symbolic idea behind it. But I think they're real. I think John was seeing a real thing happening. And I think that when these things show up, these visitors that man is reaching out for, come, come down to us and help us out, we see from the Bible that they're bringing war, they're bringing famine, they are bringing people hating one another, they're bringing death, and they're unleashing hell on this earth. Here's an event out of Nuremberg, Germany. April 14th, 1561, residents of Nuremberg witnessed what seemed to be an aerial battle over their city. They described objects shaped like orbs, crosses, cylinders, and a black arrow-like vessel, uh, which sounds a little bit like the triangles, the black triangles that people are seeing nowadays. After some time, they heard what seemed to be a major crash outside of the city. It'd be interesting to know exactly where that crash took place. and kind of makes you wonder if anything is still there or not. This happened in 1697, Hamburg, Germany. People saw what they described as two glowing wheels up in the sky. This image here is from French manuscript from the 12th century, refers to a sighting in 776 AD in France, quote, something resembling two large flaming shields of reddish color moving above the church itself. See, I think all throughout history, I think people were seeing things up in the sky. I don't think this is a new event. We know that Ezekiel saw something. We know that Zechariah saw something. We know that Elijah and Elisha knew what these chariots were, what they were associated with. These are spirits. We would say then they are the angelic realm, but of course, all throughout history, those who are not associated with God's word don't know what God's word says. To them, they're the gods. So they would say, these are the gods. Or in maybe in medieval Europe, they would say, these are you know, the angels visiting us. And a lot of times they would see that as a, as a good sign of things. But I don't think they are. I think they represent something a lot more diabolical than that. This kind of brings us up to the late 1800s. March 29th, 1897, the Topeka State Journal wrote this. A mysterious airship was seen again last night for the third time by a number of Omaha's reputable citizens. It hove in sight about the time that church was over. In a half hour, it had traversed the heavens and had once more disappeared. It was seen by people in all parts of the city. This time, notice they called it the airship. This is back before the Wright brothers flew their first plane. So the airship came into view in the southeastern portion of the horizon. It was in the shape of a big bright light, too big for a balloon, and glowed steadily. It sailed over the city to the northwest and there disappeared behind the houses and bluffs. It moved very slowly and seemed to be quite near the earth. Nothing but the light was visible. A big crowd at 24th and Lake Streets watched the trip of the visitor and speculated upon it. So this was written in the newspaper, 1897. That brings us up to 1947. Now you have what everybody calls the inaugural event of the modern UFO phenomenon. 1947, a man by the name of Kenneth Arnold um, it's attributed to him, the phrase flying saucers, even though he never said these were flying saucers. What he actually said was they skipped across the tops of the mountains and across the air like 
saucers skipping across a pond. June 24, 1947, Kenneth Arnold reported seeing nine objects glowing bright blue, white, flying in a V formation over Mount Rainier in Washington State. He estimated the object's flight speed at over 1,700 miles per hour and compared their motion to a saucer if you skipped it across water. A prospector on Mount Adams saw the objects at around the same time as Arnold, providing a second witness to his story. Now, remember that Kenneth Arnold was a pilot. and What he was doing was he was, he was a salesman. He sold firefighting equipment. So he had his own plane, and he's flying back from a sales trip, and he's flying around Mount Rainier because he had heard that a plane went down in Mount Rainier, and nobody knew where it was. So he was flying around the mountain looking for evidence of where this plane might have crashed or whatever. And that's when he saw these flying saucer-shaped disc flying in formation through the air. Now, the interesting thing is, is that later on they actually found the plane that Kenneth Arnold was looking for. None of its occupants were in that plane. All of the parachutes were still in the plane. Nobody knows what happened to this very day to the crew or the passengers or even what happened to cause the plane to go down. The people just vanished. Then, less than a month later, Roswell, July 8th, 1947. Now, a lot of stories have been made about Roswell and what happened at Roswell. Some say saucers went down. Some say that it was just a weather balloon. In fact, that's the, that was the Army's second story, that it was just a weather balloon. They came out and showed the pieces of a busted up weather balloon, and they said, this is really what it was. But the initial statement, the initial official statement released by the Army was that a flying saucer had crashed on a farm outside of Roswell, New Mexico. Walter Hout, Roswell Army Airfield Public Information Officer, issued a press release stating that personnel from the base had recovered a flying disc which had crashed on a ranch near Roswell. And so that story is the story that went out over the wire. Newspapers from around the world picked it up and ran with it. Um, radio stations began to air the report that the Army had found a flying saucer, an alien craft that had crashed on a farm outside of Roswell, New Mexico. It wasn't until the next day that the Army decided to change its mind about what that was. Now, the question has always been, did an alien craft of some kind crash? And did the Army recover an unidentified flying object and its inhabitants? Did they still, do they still have the craft to this day? Are they starting, have they, did they start to back engineer it? What did they do with the bodies? Were these things even real? Is this a story that people have made up to get a book written about them or to get headlines or to get money of some way? That's the mystery about it because you, you have credible testimony from people who were in the military that have had some sort of relationship to this craft, to the idea of it being back engineered, and the testimony of people who say that they saw or had some form of contact with the aliens who inhabited this craft. 
Now later on I'm going to share with you some of that information that I found. Do I believe it? It's hard not to. Do I have a firm biblical answer on it yet? Not yet. But the idea of UFOs and what is really behind all of this, in my mind there's no doubt as to the prophetic implications. If all of this is true, this represents, in my opinion, the way I, the way I see things in scriptures, and I'm going to give the evidence as, as I go along in this, in my view, there are only two primary important things that are going to happen in this world that really initiate God's plan of ending everything that's going on in this world and Jesus Christ coming back, beginning a thousand year reign on this earth. And I believe that. There are two things that are going to happen that initiate all of this. Number one, the rapture of God's saints, God's people, us going from earth to heaven without dying and those that have died will be resurrected. But then the second thing is the beginning of what the Bible calls in the book of Daniel the fourth kingdom. And there are some things about this fourth kingdom that to me match perfectly with what all of this talk and this whole UFO thing is all about at its core is this fourth kingdom. Here's some of the evidence that instead of it being a weather balloon at Roswell, here's, there's a document that exists that just sort of gives evidence that an actual craft of some kind that was not manufactured anywhere in this world actually crashed at Roswell. This was made public by Freedom of Information Act request to Director FBI from Gary Battelle, Strategic Air Command Washington, subject flying saucers information concerning. Here's what the letter says. An investigator for the Air Forces stated that three so-called flying saucers had been recovered in New Mexico. They were described as being circular in shape with raised centers, approximately 50 feet in diameter. Each one was occupied by three bodies of human shape, but only three feet tall, dressed in metallic cloth of a very fine texture. Each body was bandaged in a manner similar to the blackout suits used by speed flyers and test pilots. According to Mr., and that name is redacted, informant, the saucers were found in New Mexico due to the fact that the government has a very high-powered radar set up in that area and it is believed the radar interferes with the controlling mechanism of the saucers. No further evaluation was attempted by, the name was redacted, concerning the above. And that apparently was written in March 22, 1950. So, was it true? There's evidence to say that it was. Now, exactly what it was, I'm not sure. But I know that from 1947, from Kenneth Arnold and his sighting, and of course it goes, you know, that story goes around the world. Then, not, not just a month later, you have the crash, or the alleged craft, of saucer-shaped objects in Roswell, New Mexico, and that story going around the world, it just seems like that from 1947 on, UFO mania hits this world. And now all of a sudden, whether people were seeing these things before 1947, and I believe they were, because you have the World War II pilots who were reporting what they called Foo Fighters. These guys were seeing bright, lit objects in the sky. And I'm talking about our Air Force guys fighting in World War II. 
were seeing these things and initially they thought they were some type of new German aircraft. Later to find out that they weren't. The Germans didn't have anything like that. They were kind of working on something like that, but they didn't have anything operational that we know of. So they were seeing things in the sky and we have evidence, we have photographs, I'll show those, of people seeing objects in the sky prior to 1947, prior to World War II. But really from 1947 on you have this massive explosion. Now, now that it's in people's minds, now when they see things in the sky, they feel like they need to tell somebody. So they're telling the Army Air Force. And the Air Force is getting so many calls, they decide to do something about it. They said, we need to have somebody look into this. So they initially started what was called Project Grudge. Project Grudge eventually became what was known as Project Blue Book. They assigned the task to some military guys and to some scientists. One of those scientists was a man by the name of J. Allen Hynek. He was a physicist. And I think he was chosen because he didn't believe in them. He did not believe that we were being visited by any kind of aliens from other planets coming to this world. I mean, he was a man of science. He had no evidence. He had no proof. Therefore, if it's not in a test tube, it doesn't exist. And that's the approach. And I think that's why they had Heineck come in, was because he, he was a skeptic. So, and I really think that the powers that be, I, I do, I think that there are people inside the government of the United States that for whatever the reason, whether it's philosophical reasons or religious reasons or national defense reasons, they don't want any information about what these things are leaked out to the public. Maybe they're patriots. Maybe they have very good reason why they don't want disclosure of the government's knowledge of what these things are because you have to understand pilots were reporting these things doing things that our pilots couldn't do and they were appearing in airspace that was the sole airspace in the United States of America and they would pop in and pop out and the idea was our guys couldn't do anything about it we couldn't stop them from coming we couldn't hold them while they were there and we couldn't keep them from leaving and we couldn't chase them so from a defense standpoint, you have a threat to the defenses of the United States of America. And so maybe some of these guys are patriots and they're saying, we, since we can't control them, we see them as a threat. Maybe there's some guys in the Pentagon that are Christians. And they believe that there's something evil and diabolical about this. That's what I believe. So they don't see these as friendly visitors or friendly visitations. And I agree with that. So there's this idea that Project Blue Book was basically uh, a scam. It was to make this whole UFO, UFO thing look like it was nothing and Heineck and the other advisors and the other investigators were to investigate all of these and to, and to make them out to be either uh, a supernova or a meteor or swamp gas or weather balloon or airplane lights, anything except a genuine unidentified flying object. And by that term, you're saying we cannot identify it as swamp gas, we can't identify it as an airplane, we can't identify it as a star or a meteor or anything else tangible and known to man. It remains unidentified. Whether you say that that is aliens from the planet Mars coming to visit us saying we are your friends or it's some evil diabolical uh, future war on planet Earth from, you know, you've, I've seen all the movies, you've seen all the movies too. They're about half of, the, half of the UFO movies are either in favor of this visitation 
or they see this alien contact as the beginning of the end of the human race. Take your pick. So Project Blue Book was basically, it was the Air Force's way, I guess the government's way of sweeping this under the rug saying, don't worry about it, go on about your business. Let's live the American way. So that's why I think they brought Dr. Heineck in. Heineck was to come in as a skeptic and to say, you people are wasting your time looking in the sky for these things. Don't worry about it. I'm the doctor. I'm the learned scientist. I'm saying that people are just dreaming this up or there's a logical explanation for it, but it's certainly not alien. So it was Dr. Heineck that came up with the classification system. My mom didn't take me to very many movies when I was a boy. Um, we weren't allowed to watch very many movies. But she did, I bugged her to death until she went, she let me go see Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And I was just fascinated by this movie because, like I say, I've been interested in UFOs all my life. Well, Dr. Heineck is the one who came up with that classification system. Close Encounters of the First Kind means a verified UFO sighting. In other words, we can't explain it away as swamp gas or a plane or a star. So it actually qualifies as the sighting of a flying object that is yet unidentified. So the first kind of contact is we saw it in the sky. The second kind, close encounters of the second kind is a verified either a UFO landing or like a photograph was taken or it left imprints in the dirt and a picture was taken of that and measurements were made or it left some material, some sort of tangible evidence like a video, film, a photograph, it left its mark and there's evidence afterward. That's a close encounter of the second kind. A close encounter of the third kind. This is why Spielberg made his movie and I've since found out in doing all this I mean, I've watched hours of testimony of, you know, UFO landings, UFO contact people. I found out that a lot of the characters that Spielberg put in his movie were based upon real events, real people that had encounters with UFOs. So close encounters of the third kind is verified alien contact. In other words, a ship landed, aliens appeared out of that ship, and that's what Spielberg put in his movie. There's a scene in Close Encounters of the Third Kind that when the mothership comes down, this huge mothership comes down and it's letting out all these people that disappeared in the Bermuda Triangle or that had been abducted by aliens. It's letting all these people out. And then there's the appearance of these aliens. There's one scene, it only lasts like three or four seconds, of this man, and we know he's important, we know he's smart, and a scientist because he's smoking a pipe. That ends up being Dr. J. Allen Hynek. And Spielberg contacted him and said, would you appear as a cameo in this film? And of course he agreed, and the rest is history. Here's the thing. Hynek starts out as a skeptic. He doesn't believe that there can be alien craft visiting our planet. By the time he's done, he's a believer. Because 90% of the thousands and thousands of cases that Blue Book, it was finally closed out in the 60s, out of the thousands of cases that they investigated, 90% of them, they said, are identifiable. Plane, flying weather balloon, swamp gas, hallucination, people drunk, whatever. It was the 10% that he couldn't account for. 10%. Now remember what I said. Out of all of the UFO stories that come out every year, in the thousands, 
people seeing them, people photographing them, people videotaping them, on their streaming them live or whatever. I mean, this is the age where nothing can be kept secret any longer in this world. Only one of those stories has to be true before we have a situation where we have to, it, it makes us ask the question, who are these people? Why are they here? What's, what is their purpose for coming here? And this is where, as Christians, we have to bring the Bible into this discussion. The Bible has to be, it has to tell us, the, it has to give us the answers. we got to know from the scriptures. what these. Because out of all these stories, I don't know who to believe. Do I believe that we actually have a crash vehicle that from Roswell? Do we, do we have people at Area 51 working on re-engineering craft? Do we have people in the government that are trying to cover all this up? Are there men in black? Do we actually have abductions? Is uh, Whitley Strieber telling the truth? Is Betty and Bar I'll tell you about those in a little bit. Is Travis Walton, is he telling the truth? Are the guys that were with him, are they being honest about what they saw? Because if they are, then we have to know the truth. And the only truth that I know of, that I trust 100%, is the truth given to me in the scriptures.